welcome this evening. And uh, could I just ask you just a bit of housekeeping, if everybody could please put their phones on silent. You're welcome to use it to take photographs if you want to post, uh, or just for your records. Uh, but please, if you wouldn't mind. So I have some, I'm going to read from written notes only because I find my memory is failing me a good bit. Join the club, I know what the feeling is. So you're all so welcome uh, to the Dingle Lit Fest and this evening's session and discussion uh, on the power of fiction to inform us about history. I believe very strongly that historical fiction helps us to find uh, the richness of textures, you know, rough and smooth, pitted and prickly, uh, that just is not in the remit, it doesn't come under the remit of history books. Uh, novelists can bring a very, very plain skeleton of facts into life that can be felt, heard, smelt, and tasted even. Because true, you know, understanding the true motivations of public fig figures who have shaped the history of the world, uh, whose decisions enable joy and victory for some, and defeat and despair for others is nearly impossible without a contextual understanding of their own personal circumstances, their relationships, their fears, and their desires. Writers of historical fiction, I believe, imagine and insert that context into their narratives and add a human layer uh, to the bare skeleton of historical facts. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists who both do that job just brilliantly. So to my left <laughs> is uh, Michelle Gallen. Michelle was born in Tyrone in, in the 1970s and she grew up during the Troubles a few miles from what she was told was the Free State and the United Kingdom. She studied English literature at Trinity College Dublin and publishing at Stirling University. She won several prestigious awards as a young writer before having a devastating brain injury in her mid-twenties. Her second novel, which I've just finished, Factory Girl, and it's an absolutely brilliant book, is now available in England, Ireland, and the USA. She lives in Dublin with her husband and children. And sitting beside Michelle is Martina Devlin, an uh, old friend of mine, uh, who has written 11 books and two plays and is also an award-winning journalist. She has won a V.S. Pritchard Prize from the Royal Society of Literature and a Hennessy Literary Award. Martina presents the City of Books podcast for Dublin UNESCO City of Literature, and she is the first holder of a PhD in literary practice from Trinity College Dublin where she has taught Irish literature. So that's our two guests for this evening. Researching for this event, I came across this quote, the, histor the historian will tell you what happened, but the novelist will tell you what it felt like. Yeah. And how very true is that? It was such a pleasure for me preparing for this session because I started with reading both Michelle's Factory Girls uh, as well as Martina's book, Edith they could not have been two more perfect books to set the basis for this discussion this evening. In Edith, Martina has taken real characters from history and fictionalized their thoughts and motivations in that specific 1920s period. In Factory Girls, Michelle has created fictional characters and gets them to live through a real moment in history. We have but 40 minutes to hear their thoughts uh, before we open up to questions, so I'll get stuck in straight away. So to each of you, perhaps Michelle first. Uh, you know, you've written a book set, uh, you know, set in, in, in Belfast in the 19, mm. uh, in the 1980s. Well, it, it's, it's set sorry, in, it's set in, in Tyrone. In Tyrone, yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah. But, well, kind of yeah. just rural, yeah. I suppose, yeah. yeah. Uh, and do you believe that it is possible to more deeply understand and learn the past through fiction? Um, well, I think it's really important to, so, so, so the troubles, which is, I mean, always a backdrop to, to both, to my books. Books, yeah. 
the Troubles was like the first really famous media um, mm -hmm. war, right? You, yeah. you had the photographers on the streets as people started to riot. You had photographers capturing what happened at the civil rights movements. So you had reporters and photographers coming in and commenting and really sharing that mm. story with mm. people right across the, the world, world yeah. as it was. Um, but my experience growing up in Northern Ireland was very much that I might see an incident um, happen, like just happen with your own two eyes in front of you and by the time it reached the television, if it reached the television yeah. at all, yeah. or by the time it was in the newspapers, it was a very different, different event story. to yeah. the thing that yeah. I'd seen. Mm. And I, I always had this idea that, you know, I always had this idea there was an, an injustice done to the people who were mm. experiencing mm. things in the way mm. that they were recorded or the way that they were recorded and then narrated on screen. Yeah. Um, so I feel, I know for me it's very much that I grew up feeling like I wanted to tell it like it is. Mm. Like I really mm. wanted to say to people, but that's not what happened. Like this is what happened. Yeah. Um, but I kind of feel that fiction is a safe place for me to do that. I'm actually still quite scared of memoir and actually okay. really writing down things maybe and, and putting putting them down in a kind of saying that this is fact, this is what happened. Yeah. But yeah. definitely I find fiction gives me this more playful or safer place to explore things that I maybe saw firsthand. Yeah, I, I just found the, you know, Michelle's book Factory Girl for girls for any, any of you who haven't read the book um, it is an account of a, a summer waiting for high school leaving results yeah. uh, and you know the aspirations and hopes of these three girls uh, set against the backdrop of the troubles it's just a wonderful book and it the way you set it with both the communities mm. Uh, which, which was something I never knew that two, the two communities actually worked together in certain in certain situations. You know that they they would have had uh, actual jobs together. Yeah, was something I, I wouldn't have known. Well, not always. I mean, and and again in Northern Ireland, you you did have different experiences, maybe in Derry or in Belfast yeah. or in yeah. other parts of the yeah. north. But where I grew up, it was a very divided town. It was, yeah. and, you know, obviously the schools were segregated, the churches, mm. Mm. you know, a lot of the shops were, and so I grew up really not knowing any Protestants. And then the idea, I mean, I, I worked one summer in a shirt factory and mm. was suddenly thrown, like a tiny little town, 3,000 people, and then suddenly to be thrown into a factory going, oh my God, I have to work with you now. And yeah, like, yeah. You're, you're Protestant, that's totally different to me. And then actually not even, do you, do you know what I mean? You're basically working with Christians that's and right. yeah, yeah, with who people. grew up in the same yeah, town yeah, as you, yeah, like yeah, identical yeah, to you yeah, really, but yeah. this I like, really othered them. So because of the segregation, it was an incredibly like, alien experience yeah. to sit down and work with yeah. or work side by side yeah, yeah. and i mean I, I can relate to that because uh, when we came from from india yeah. uh, you know we found that whole thing of you know we had pakistani colleagues uh, working in the hospital yeah. my, my husband would have had pakistani colleagues and like you know to have to go out and have a meal with them and and just you know actually talk about why why are we so you know anti each other yeah. why are we so separate when we can actually outside the yeah. subcontinent we can be perfectly good friends. It was, you know, and also yeah. when you leave your, you know, territory of dispute, mm, and like mm. you say, you go work in London, mm. and then to everybody you're just a paddy. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so suddenly there's no such thing as I'm an Ulster yeah, Protestant. Yeah. I believe in my yeah. British identity. It's like I'll look at the paddies in the corner, and you're like, That's oh right. yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about you, Martino? What, what do you feel about the power of, um, you know, are we able to understand history better through fiction? Well, it's about empathy, I suppose, mm, isn't mm, it? Mm. So you can show a character's dilemmas. Um, I mean, I suppose I've son done something a little bit different with Edith, although I've written four historical fiction works. Um, but with this one in particular, I've blended uh, character, uh, people who actually lived, I've imagined their thoughts, and I've blended that with fictional characters. Um, the thing about writing historical fiction is no one gives you a rule book mm. and says this is how you do mm. it. Mm. And you're doing something quite different to the historian or the biographer, um, which is that you're imagining the thoughts and the conversations of characters. And you're doing that to bring mm. them to life. Mm. Mm. Um, you know the what of history, what historical fiction does is try and understand the why, and that's down to human motivations. And what I very quickly learned is whether they lived in the 
pre-Christian era or the medieval period or the 1800s or the early 1900s, people are fundamentally the same. Oh, They're yeah. susceptible yeah. to the same yeah. emotions. Um, and uh, w once you realize that and bring that to bear on the work, um, it makes it a whole lot easier. And the other thing as an historical fiction writer you have to un really accept is that you may well make mistakes. You try very hard not to. You do the due diligence, the research, but short of jumping into a time machine and going back into your historical period, some of it is guesswork. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I actually yeah. have a question for Michelle, not to uh, take your role. I was just so interested when she was talking about how uh, when you were talking about how things were reported differently, yeah. because I've reported on the Troubles, yeah. you know, and f I'm from the North as yeah. well. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of things like reporting on the Good Friday mm. Agreement, on the peace process, uh, on the Oma Bomb, which is yeah. my hometown. And I'm kind of curious about in what way you felt the misrepresentation happened. Um, so I remember a really simple thing. Um, there was a there was a fellow in our town and he wasn't the full round of the clock and like so he was always at something right so then anyway this one day he was way up in the fields he was up he was really he was he was a big rabbit hunter so he was up in the hills he was up in the fields hunting a rabbit and he came across a wee bomb and as i say he wasn't right in the head and he brought the bomb home mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to a housing estate in mm -hmm. castle derg and then diffused it in his front yard and then somebody was like Oh my God, look what he's at. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so somebody eventually called the police who called the army bomb disposal, who then, this got reported on the news that the British army had found a device planted in a Catholic house in the state okay. with mm -hmm. no care or attention mm -hmm. for the people that lived there. And we were like, that was a landmine designed for you for two miles up the road. Mm -hmm. But what got reported was so different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole incident was designed to do an angle that was not there were not community voices, it was not our version. It was, so, I mean, it was far from the truth. And this did happen. I mean, I remember being a kid and I think it was about, I think maybe the 15 year anniversary of um, uh, Bloody Sunday. And like, you know when you know people who've been there and you know what happened. And I remember this British newspaper having, still having a big headline about these petrol bombers, mm -hmm. about these IRA people. Like a narrative that's so far from what people in the streets saw. But that was deliberate in misinformation yeah, from, yeah. from the authorities. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was deliberately. Yeah. And in fact, that is where the power of the media came in, in a way, because it was the images, it was the photographs, and yeah. it was the TV cameras mm -hmm. in that case showing people running away, not running towards, yeah, towards the paratroopers, yeah, yeah. firing but at them, running away. still a narrative away. dominated mm. for what, uh, still a narrative, yeah. you know, a, a narrative dominated for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And you, I, when I worked in London, you will still talk to people who would claim mm -hmm. to know, if they claim mm -hmm. to know anything, they'll know the media thing. And so for me, when somebody talks about, oh, I know about the troubles, because mm. I, I went on YouTube and I looked at some news reports, I'm going, you know, first-hand accounts, perhaps, and not of the big things, but like the actual lived experience of people. Do you know that ordinary thing of going to a shop? Mm. It's like, I, I remember my mommy taking the six of us into a, a shoe shop after school one day, and we all got our wee shoes fitted, and then we went home. In between us leaving the shop and getting home, the, the shoe man was shot dead, and the shop was blown up. Mm. And, you know, there's, all of the, there's a whole load of narratives around that, and if you just watch the news report, you never get the full story or the, the complexity of it. You, and this is all the stuff I love to see when I come to yeah. historical fiction. Yeah. I don't want yeah. to go on YouTube and get this 30 second report of that poor man's death. I, I want to know the tapestry, the kind of storm around it, you know? But you're yeah. comparing apples and pears. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is where are you going to get that if you don't mm. get it from historical you get it fiction? fiction. Mm. Do you know, it's a different, yeah. it's a different I thing. I think the, the the micro stories, many yeah. micro stories, then give you a better picture of the of the whole story. Yeah, you know, yeah. rather than just getting the whole story from the one source. Yeah, uh, just coming back to you, Martina. Uh, I'm I was remiss. I, I actually didn't say anything about what what Edith is about. So would you mind telling? Of course. So it's set everybody? in 1921, 1922 against 
a backdrop of the, um, the War of Independence is ending, the um, Anglo-Irish Treaty is being negotiated, and then um, it, as it draws to a close, the Civil War is, is starting to get going. And um, the reason I did that, um, it came about really by accident. I, I wanted to write about Edith Somerville, who was one half of Somerville and Ross, and some of you may remember the Irish RM TV series from the 80s, which was based on their short stories. But they um, had a you know, quite long and successful career. They were critically and commercially acclaimed. And um, then in 1915, December 1915, Ross died, um, Edith's second cousin and collaborator. And she thought she couldn't write anymore after having had several decades of success. And she did something quite audacious in 1916, a few months later. She persuaded herself that she was continuing to collaborate with Ross through spiritualism, through seances and automatic or trance writing. And this is what intrigued me and made me think I'd write, like to write a novel about that. I think she was sincere in her belief. She was really convinced that she was having conversations with Ross about plot and character. But she had inherited all their literary archive. They, she had lots of notes and letters about ideas for books. And they'd worked together over a long period. So um, she certainly had material there. Why I say it was audacious, um, she didn't know writing as Edith Somerville would she continue to have a career. You know, the brand, they were one of the first literary brands, Somerville and Ross, and as Somerville alone, she might not have had that audience. So it was astute of her to do this, to insist on retaining the dual signature and keeping going with it. Uh, now, her agent and her publisher didn't really believe her, but it created a mystery, and a mystery is good for business. Mm. So they went along with it. And the reason I then chose 1921, 1922, which I really only decided when I was about, you know, some way through the novel, was that um, after Ross's death and for a few years going forward, Edith was in turmoil, wondering had she a career? And then as well, she was from the big house tradition, rents had collapsed, they were struggling to keep the houses and then, you know, the big houses were being uh, set on fire and families were leaving. And the turmoil in the country at this period, to me, was um, reflected in the turmoil in Edith's own life. So it made sense to look at a very long life, like she died at the age of 91, through the prism of these two years. Mm. Um, you know, when I finished reading the book, the one thing I wondered in connection with this discussion was, you know, why did you, why did you choose to fictionalize it? How come you didn't write a biography? Like what made you go the fictional route? Well, I'm not a biographer and I don't want okay. to be. Okay, okay. Um, straight, simple no. as that, yeah. Um, yeah. And historical fiction can go places, as you know, yeah. that yeah. biography can't. You know, as a biographer, as an historian, you mm. can't imagine conversations. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. You yeah. know, like yeah. there's a scene where the, uh, an IRA flying column breaks into mm. the house. I mm. know that that happened mm. from letters mm. she wrote. Mm. I know that it really happened. I don't know what the IRA men said to Edith and she said yeah. to them. Yeah. So yeah. as a fiction writer, you can um, imagine yourself into that world. But, but perhaps because my background is in journalism as well, I like, I like to be on solid ground. Mm. I like to check mm. the facts. And there's a lot of material you can read and research. I mean, I find Ernie O'Malley's On Another Man's Wound very, very useful to understand what it was like inside the mind of the flying column, mm. um, a column man, as they called it. Uh, and he, he, he wrote a trilogy. So there's material like that that you can research. Uh, there are members of the big house tradition, Hubert Butler and so on. Um, uh, Lady Gregory, who've written mm. about mm. Uh, uh, IRA incursions into their houses, people who've lo who lost their houses, who were you know, set on fire, have written about it. And, um, 
so there's a lot yeah. of material. Yeah, and but I mean, apart from, from yes, and I, 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 I just really love the way that, apart from the fact that you know Edith Somerville is was a public figure and is a public figure even even in our you know as as a literary person, but I love the way you wove in other real public figures into the into the book. You mean like George Bernard Shaw? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, <laughs> and and <laughs> also her book. agent. And you know other other people, you know, yeah. but you also wove in, which I've just found just such a f absolutely fantastic um, technique or tool, uh, you know, in the narrative to, to progress the narrative or to to reveal the story was the use of her fictional character, Florina. Flory. I mean, I just thought that was so so what such a fantastic way to you know, to reveal her thoughts through her fictional character. I was just quite amazed, you know, I, so I loved that. She was very fond of Flurry Knox, who mm. some of you may remember as this uh, primary character in the Irish RM series, and he's always pulling one over on Major Yates, the hapless Major Yates, famously was described as uh, a gentleman among stable boys and a stable boy among gentlemen, a half sir, <laughs> they called him. Um, but uh, yeah, you, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about this, Michelle, but I think it's quite risky in some ways mm. taking mm. a real mm. character mm. and and fictionalizing them because I mean, especially with someone like say George Bernard Shaw, yeah. you, you could you could veer into caricature yeah, very yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I became very fond of Shaw, and I visited his house uh, in Iod St Lawrence in Hertfordshire, and I, I felt that I had more of a handle on him after walking around the house. And then the novelist is looking mm. for a little back toys yeah. that will bring yeah. it to life. Yeah. And I, I spotted weighing scales in all of the rooms. And I said to one of the guides, what's the story with all the weighing scales? And she said, he was obsessed with weighing himself, apparently. Mm. And he was always <laughs> rushing off, checking he hadn't put on an ounce. And it's little details yeah, like details, this that bring yeah. someone yeah to life. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah. I went and read his plays afterwards mm -hmm. and so forth, but I don't know, I found those weighing scales very, very interesting. I imagine he was a monster to live with in many ways, and yet he was this, he was, um, he, he was an egalitarian at heart, and there was something else I came across that brought him to life for me. And you know, you can rummage around on the internet as long as you like, and you can read things, but there's nothing like going to the place and walking around. And another fact I found there was that he liked to ride up front of the car with uh, <laughs> his chauffeur, Fred Day, you know, not comfortable with being chauffeured around in the back. Um, and there was, Fred Day told a story um, which I came across somewhere that it was a very wet day. He was chauffeuring uh, Mr. Shaw wherever he wanted to go. And Shaw noticed that as they went past a bus stop, very heavy rain, a woman and a little girl standing at the bus stop. And Fred Day made a kind of a little sign, like a little, you know, almost like a little wave. And Shaw said, what are you doing, Day? And Fred Day said, well, I'm just waving, and he said, do you know those people? And Day said, yes, I do. Who are they? It's my wife and daughter. <laughs> and Shaw made him turn the car around and pick up his wife and daughter and give them a lift to where they were going. And I kept this story in my head. I didn't work it into the novel. It didn't have a place in the novel. But it reminded me that when Shaw was being difficult, mm. <laughs> as he, you know, he was puckish, he had a good heart. Mm. So I've spoken too much. No, I want no, to hear I'm it. Away. Do, you, it. No. do you put real characters in as well with fictional characters? I'd be shot if I admitted that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yes. And that's so true. <laughs> I, um, the small town I'm from, right, Castle mm. Derrick. Mm. I know Castle Derrick. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know their book club? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, I, so the, book, I, yeah. with the, the book club invited or wanted to invite me to come because they're not happy with what I'm writing because Ooh. Ooh. it paints our town in a bad light. And I'm going, but I don't write about Castle Derg. I yeah. write about a wee fictional town. Yeah. Go, but you see, you're making Castle Derg look very bad. And I go, but it's not Castle Derg. It's because you're from there, they think mm. that it's... So they decided to invite me to the Castle Derg book club. To beat you up metaphorically. <laughs> Literally, this is what they said. They said, and this is a message that was sent to me 
well, we heard about your heart condition, so we decided you mightn't be fit to come to our book club where we would confront you. <laughs> so everything's fictional, all those characters are not real. That is not Castle Jerk. <laughs> what do you call it in the book? This one's a hibogi. I didn't even give it a name in this because I was too scared. That's true. <laughs> yeah. well, you need to give it a name. Plausible deniability, Michelle. <laughs> but the thing is, you know when you grow up in a wee town, you only ever call it the town. I'm going into yeah, the, town. the town. Oh, where were you up the town? We were in the town. What's the town doing the day? You never actually say yeah. like the actual title. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, yeah. It, 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 yeah, I think there's an element of let's not name it. And then an all, you, know, you, don't, you don't go around saying the town's name usually. Time, yeah. yeah. Michelle, when you were writing the book, yeah. what, was there some reason you made your your three main girls, you know, the, the, your, your characters, teenagers, like, you know, oh. why, why, was there a reason you wanted to tell the story from that point of view, from a young teenager's? You I know, just school? think it's really interesting, you know, when you've spent all those years at school mm. and you've learned mm. everything that you're supposed to, that they think you can learn officially anyway in a small town. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know that bit where you're going, I have applied to become somebody different in mm. somewhere different mm. Mm. and mm. it all depends on exam results. Yeah, because I, mm. I, I did feel that, you know, yet again, here is another way, you know, historical fiction, in history books, you, you would never hear the voice of a teenager. Yeah. You know, you would never hear it from their point of view. And, I just and a poor teenager, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and a, you yeah, know, a teenager yeah. that you wouldn't think of as the ideal yeah, teenager yeah, who doesn't yeah, come from the ideal yeah, family yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah so it was a real an, an insight into it from a different point yeah. of view you know so uh, just just leading on from that um, you know historic historical fiction uh, goes with the idea that historical events can be told from multiple points of view uh, it seeks to you know it achieves this by introducing readers to characters whose ideas and values vary completely from the readers uh, and also you know responses to events are different from character to character so what i am going to put to you is given all the old festering conflicts that are you know going on in the world and the new ones that are being birthed every single day and every moment around the globe do you think reading historical fiction might give us as I was saying earlier, you know, small micro understandings of the larger picture. Does it make us more empathetic to the issues that face ordinary people in these areas of conflict? So I suppose my, my particular angle would be, you know, we are talking, some of us are talking at the moment about a united Ireland mm, mm. and saying we should do this, we should do that. And I sometimes am interested in just how little people might know of the lived experience of people. So people down south might not know. They can't know what the lived experience was like in the north. Mm. And I feel that the more understanding northerners have of the south mm. and why the society down here has been engineered the way it was, how we ended up with Magdalene Laundries, how we ended up with private schools funded by the government. How, how did this government, <laughs> or how did this country build itself to be like that? And mm. why is the North the way it is? Because if we really are talking, really and truly, honestly talking about engineering a new island, the more we know about what happened different people, mm. the more you know about their experiences, the better chance we have to de design something that's of course, better, everybody. that yeah. will help yeah. everyone yeah. and help everybody feel like they're seen, that they're included, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that they have a stake in whatever the new society might look like if we ever get to that point. So I, I'm a big believer in reading as much. I, I'm not I'm not crazy about history books. Mm -hmm. History books sometimes are too dry, dry and it yeah. is something like when, yeah. you, when you've got Edith and you're sitting and you feel that there's this walking, talking, living, breathing mm. person mm. with feelings and emotions and mm. that to me is really important. And for factory girls, I mean, I, like I did work in a factory, but it was the summer of 95 and I just know that you know, so much of that lived experience it was so intense and in, still informs mm. who I am mm. right now. Mm. And you know, you're you're going to the more we know about everybody's experience, whether it was the, you know growing up in Mayo yeah. And, yeah. and going yeah. to Christian Brothers School, yeah. or whether you yeah. were really rich and wealthy in Dublin mm. and you mm. actually got an English accent because you went to English boarding school, mm. but you're still of your Irish mm. passport. Mm. All of those things will feed a better a better design of a, a new, or yeah. a, you know, yeah. Yeah. whatever because, we do with yeah. the island. Yeah. For sure, for sure. How about you, Martina? What do you feel about, you know, all these small, these smaller stories and how it might contribute? Uh, and e even if you just look outside of Ireland, 
uh, you know, uh, with the conflict now in Ukraine, yeah. so many of us don't know anything about the Baltic countries, the, you know, the ex-Soviet um, republics, uh, and, and how Russia controlled them. I mean, you know, we, we hardly know anything about any of those conflicts. And wh what do you think, Martina? Well, I think you can learn a lot from a country by reading its fiction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Ireland is very lucky in that its fiction is read worldwide uh, and its poetry. And it gives, it, it, it is part of what helps Ireland punch above its weight internationally. Um, we don't tend to read, as you say, Central European mm. so much. Mm. We might read French or German mm. in translation. Mm. But I spoke to a Ukrainian writer who, uh, from Kiev, living in Kiev, who came to Dublin a couple of weeks ago to do a few events and to talk about what was happening in her country. I mean, in many ways, it was a bit like growing up during the Troubles mm. because she mm. was saying things like, yes, I went out on my balcony and we saw the kind of, you know, uh, a bomb going off here or I walked down the street and there used to be a shop there and it's not there anymore. Mm. I was kind of listening to all this thinking, that has a familiar ring. Um, but what I took from our conversation was that, okay, you're describing your country in a state of conflict, but at some stage that state of conflict will end. And I suppose for, for Irish people or English people or American people, whoever, who, whoever are thinking about those countries, a way of connecting with the countries is really through stories. Mm -hmm. You know, stories are, um, are, are how we make sense of the world. And so that's where fiction comes into its own. Although I would also argue that a good television bulletin or a good newspaper article um, telling an, you know, a true story will also achieve that. You know, it is, it is story-led mm. often. Mm. I mean, you try and explain a difficult subject through personalizing it. And this week, for example, I wrote a column about what was happening in, uh, I read a column on Fridays in the Irish Independent. I can pretty much choose what I write about, but it's an op-ed, so it's current affairs. You know, it's, 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 it's a current affairs column. And this week, one of the stories in the news was the abuse at Black Rock College in Dublin. And I managed to have a chat with a, um, a very impressive man called Louis Hoffman, who was one of the uh, people who spoke at the press conference. I, I had a, a chat with him afterwards. He was a friend of a friend. So um, I was lucky enough to be able to do that because you get a better story that way, by which I don't mean a headline grabbing thing. I mean that you get a better sense of what the story was than sitting listening at the press conference. Um, you, you have more of an understanding of it. And back to those little factoids that I love as mm. a novelist. So Louis, um, what was interesting about him is he was, he, he wasn't abused, fortunately, okay? He was brought into a room, um, he, he was messing at assembly or at a school concert, a particular priest, um, you know, hauled him out, he was brought up to a room and then he said the priest locked the door and he thought he was going to get what he called uh, biffed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, the priest then touched him. And Louis's response was just to scream as loud as he possibly could, okay, which is actually a very human mm -hmm. and sensible response, but some people, you know, would naturally freeze as well. But anyway, he obviously terrified this man who immediately unlocked the door and pushed him out, you know? And uh, Louis then kind of put it out of his mind for a good number of years, but in later life uh, uh, used his IT skills to set up a Facebook page asking people, he knew there were stories, they all did, so asking people to use the Facebook page as a tool, it was a private page, to use it as a tool, okay, to share their stories. And this gave them a platform, but also crucially, 
the same stories about the same individuals mm. amounts to a body yeah. of evidence, evidence. Yeah. you know? Yeah. So Louis was explaining all this to me in a way that never proper, I actually had listened to an audio of the press conference. I managed to get a, a raw feed of the entire, it was an hour and a half. And I listened to all that and I kind of thought I understood the story. But I didn't until I sat and had a conversation with them. Mm. And, and then the little factoid he gave me then, or he just mentioned in passing, which I thought, wow. He said one of the stories he heard on his Facebook page was from a kid who, uh, whose mother died at the age of 10 or 11. And um, one of these men who'd been abusing with impunity said to the child, if you do this, your mother will go to heaven. Oh my goodness. Oh no. my goodness. So, and exactly, that was my reaction. Yeah. And that's what I mean yeah. about yeah. Th yeah. these factoids. Mm. Suddenly, mm. you know, suddenly something clicks in your brain. Like yeah. your story with the guy who wasn't the full shilling, bless him, mm. and, and taking the a wee bomb home, mm. and, yeah. and then that's yeah. twisted and put on the news or something yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, just leading up. Leading from that, um, you know, uh, let me just put these glasses on. Um, do you think there is a role for historical fiction in being a voice for the minority and marginalized? I think you should answer that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, who, who may not believe that textbooks adequately explain their stories, uh, or is this too much to ask? You see, Carveri has written historical fiction as well. She's being very yeah. modest here. Yes. No. And, um, <laughs> come on, t tell the so, audience I mean, about your book. For, for me, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a book uh, about the experience of the Connacht Rangers, the regiment, the Connacht Rangers, who went to India in the 1920s and they mutinied there. But what I actually want, want what I was, the example that I was going to use was, I don't know if, if or any of you or, or many of you have seen the, the movie uh, Rabbit Proof Fence. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And for me, that was a very, very powerful moment in my, when I saw that movie, I just thought, oh my God, why is this book not, uh, why is this film not compulsory viewing in schools? Mm. The whole world should know what was done. And then similarly, you know, there were several other uh, books and films that I, I have just felt, why isn't this on the curriculum? Mm -hmm. Why is this not compulsory viewing? Mm -hmm. You know, not just, in, not just in history classes, but even geography classes, because, you know, geography, uh, the geography of the world has also influenced historical events, Do you know, where there's lack of water or where there was lack of, uh, you know, the cl climate change now, um, or, or, you know, the, the availability of minerals or oil or whatever, you know. Uh, has also influenced the history. So, you know, whether you were, whether you were in a geography class, for example, I, I can immediately think of one book written, uh, you know, it was the Sea of Poppies trilogy, uh, written by Amitav Ghosh, who's a really well-known, well-respected Indian writer. And the Sea of Poppies was about, uh, it was basically, it explained how so many Indian communities ended up in weird parts of the world, like I remember growing up thinking, why the hell are the Indians in Fiji? Like, you know, <laughs> whatever took them there? It's only blooming in my later years, like when I was 30, you know, I went to school in India. I never knew, I mean, the, the curriculum was a British curriculum. And, you know, we were, we were only taught that about the reforms. That sounds familiar to us, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did so, Tudor history, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, we learned how the British reformed India, yeah. you know, but they reformed it for their own sake, you know, in order to pillage the land. But anyway, this, this, the Sea of Poppies trilogy, I would really encourage you guys to read it. It's a fantastic set of three books. And it, it explains how, because the Brits wanted to produce opium in India in order to fight the Chinese in the Opium War, they managed to get these poor farmers who had no clue uh, what they were, what they were signing up for, uh, you know, to give to give up land, they became indentured laborers, mm -hmm. and they were told, oh, if you go to such and such place, you know, uh, and work in the plantation there, within five years you'll be back. You would have paid off your debt to us, 
And that's how they got, you know, you, that's mm -hmm. why you have Indians in Fiji, you have Indians in South Africa, you have Indians in, in Jamaica, in the West Indies. And these people never came back because they were never able to pay their debt back. And I mean, that's something I am so ashamed to say that I found out through a book of fiction, mm. Do you know? And then afterwards went back to look, look it up and, and find out, yes, this man has written a very, very uh, accurate account of what happened, Do you know? I can remember reading Jane Eyre in university yeah. and then afterwards reading The White Sargasso Sea. Mm. By okay. You yeah. know, yeah. And that yeah. to me was like, because I remember reading the Jane Eyre book and going, I know this is a wee romance novel, but who, who is in that attic and why are they in that? Like yeah. that's the actual story yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. And The White Sargasso Sea just blows that open, yeah. just this yeah. whole... So that's the prequel to yeah. Jane Eyre. Written by, by Jean, Jean Rhys. Yeah. 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 And do, yeah. do you know when you read it and you suddenly go, this is the cold English uh, manor house, yeah. and then yeah. Jean Reese's thing is just this rich, textured, warm, yeah. incredible yeah. landscape. Yeah. And I just love that way, actually, where there is one actual novel, yeah. then yeah. playing yeah. another novel comes and yeah. plays off it. Yeah. I think that's yeah. fabulous, yeah. you know? And, and I think another example that, that really affected Intertextuality. <laughs> Sorry, uh, academic speaking. <laughs> yeah. I also teach yeah. Irish literature, yeah. so that's called intertextuality. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know whether anybody in the audience or whether either of you have read um, Martin Malone's book, The Broken Cedar. No. Uh, I, I would really encourage you to read it. It, it is... Uh, it's about the Irish army in the Lebanon. It's fiction, fabulous book, written by an army officer. Uh, and he's such a wonderful writer, uh, based in Kildare. Uh, the book has won lots of awards. It's just one of those that, you know, was really well received, but was never widely read. Mm. And, you know, uh, The Broken Cedar, very nice book. So I'm actually just going to quickly conclude and then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, just wanted to ask, just very briefly, what book of historical fiction made you both stop, <coughs> sit back and think? And are there any favorite writers that you would recommend? I'm, I'm going to go back to, uh, my mum was a big Walter Mackin fan. Oh, okay. my dad was yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we had the whole yeah. collection yeah. and I okay. was, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and they were my first, so basically I was growing up in Northern Ireland and I started reading Walter Mackin when I was about 10 because mm. I, I'd run out of books. but. I read them all and that really lit a fire in me to want to know more about history, actual <laughs> history, but all the characters, all those people mm, and all those mm, things. Mm. And it, it gave me a sense of history, but not in this kind of like bombs and bullets way, yeah. but this yeah. kind yeah. of sense of something that is worth having and cultivating and stuff. Mm. So Walter Mackin would have been my first. Okay. And that long, all the books, he'd so many of them, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Mm. How about mm. you, Martina? Well, um, I've just been teaching at the minute, so I'm teaching for Boston University at the minute, and I've just been teaching Colin McCann's oh, Transatlantic, yeah. 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 Uh, and I think, it's a, I think it's an exceptional piece of writing, and the way he weaves real characters like mm. George, mm. Senator George Mitchell, mm. and Alcock and Brown, who were the, in 1919 did the first non-stop transatlantic flight, which was about taking the war out of the machine, because mm. before that, planes were weapons of war. Mm. So it was the idea of the passenger um, uh, vehicle. And there's a third story as well. Oh yes, the third story was uh, the, um, well he was still a slave at the time, uh, Frederick Douglass, I was going to say former slave, but he, he hadn't actually had his freedom bought at that stage, coming to Ireland at the height of the Great Famine and being quite shocked by what he saw there. So these three stories he takes in quite a slim book, mm, you know, mm, and mm. then weaves fictional characters through it. Um, I, I, I think it's... Uh, a virtuoso piece, and also the idea, because uh, emigration is a theme in so much of our literature, mm. no prizes for guessing mm. why, um, but uh, Colin McCann was bringing people back to Ireland, mm. you know, and he had the descendants of some of the emigrants returning, so I was quite interested in that, um, and then if I could also say very quickly, um, I did. I do think that she really almost 
reinvented historical fiction, and she's just died, and her name... Hilary Mantel. Hilary Mantel, yeah. Mantel, yeah. yeah. I, 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 why I cite that book is because, sure, like I was saying, we did, probably you did A level, we did yeah. A levels, I did the tutors from start to finish, They're, they stick in my mind. I disagreed fundamentally with Hilary Mantel's interpretation of Thomas Cromwell. I thought he was a bad piece of works, mm. and we know that mm. because of the body count. <laughs> She, she took a different perspective. She was explaining him. She was showing the brutalized little boy who mm, grew up mm. to be a brutal man. I think she was a lot kinder to him mm. than the historical mm. uh, records would show. But my goodness, she made him interesting. Yeah. And that's her job, you know, yeah. job yeah. done. Yeah. 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 So I, you know, before I throw the session open, uh, to questions uh, from the audience. I'd just like to finish my part with this conclusion. Churchill coined the phrase, history is written by victors. He also said that history would judge him kindly because he intended to write it himself. <laughs> <laughs> Years later, Shashi Tharoor, who is uh, you know, a, a very well-known Indian writer uh, and a member of parliament, Years later, Shashi Tharoor had this to say about Churchill's multi-volume history of the Second World War. The self-serving but elegant volumes that he authored led to the Nobel Committee, unable in all conscience to bestow him an award for peace, to give him astonishingly the Nobel Prize for Literature, an unwitting tribute to the fictional qualities <laughs> inherent in Churchill's self-justifying embellishments. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> a book of history can also be a book of fiction. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll open it up to the audience now. If anybody has any questions for, for our panelists. Yeah. Somebody there? Mm -hmm. there? Just, just someone up in front. Um. I'll just ask you to wait for the mic, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you all very much. Oh, here? Perfect. Um, first of all, a, a comment I suppose just about literary fiction to say a book I read in the last year was um, During the Grief I Goes to My Throat, which I absolutely mm -hmm. adored. Mm -hmm. And just to say, I think when you read a personalized account, whether truth or fiction, for me, it's so much easier to understand the history. I find it very hard to open a history book and read about I remember it, you might be shocked at the time, forget it, but there's nothing like the personal, and mm -hmm. from that book I learned so much about uh, I'm sorry, we can't actually hear you. Can't you? Closer, can you hear me now? No? no. Is it not on? I'll just talk yes, loud. Sorry, yeah, yeah. okay, perfect. Yeah. So just saying that for me, that book, I learned so much about history of Daniel O'Connell's family, and that time I hadn't realized the children were sent off to be reared by the local families and everything, so... Um, yeah, just that that's an example of literary fiction that uh, I got a lot from. And I just want to ask Bertina, I'm wondering what did you, about Derry Girls, um, uh, similarly that it's, it came from didn't it, the diaries of the, 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 the lady who wrote the, the, the series, and that I think it, for those from the south, where the north is a very far distance away, especially if you live in South Kerry, um, I'm just wondering if we had something like that in the 80s would we've understood better, but I think it probably was too raw then, but I think the mixture there of comedy and pathos where you had everyday life being, uh, seeing the troubles and then some of the horror and trauma being shown as well. Like for example, the, the only experience I had with the North was driving through the North on my way to Scotland. I worked there and I remember the first time I saw soldiers in khaki uniforms, I actually missed my exit from the roundabout. I was so horrified and I thought, what's it like living with this every day? And some people I got to know from the North, you didn't meet them in the South then because there was no work here. The lady saying about on her stag night or, or hen party taking a lift in an armored car and saying afterwards how stupid that was but just saying that it becomes kind of normal doesn't it in the background as well so just wondering if you had any comments on Derry Girl and thanks thank you both very much um so for Derry Girls I mean like Lisa McGee spent a long time living in London and writing and working there and figuring out how can you get your story told because getting commissioned 
for TV stuff in Ireland is very different to getting commissioned in mm -hmm. England and it's very hard. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out how do we package our story so that that usually white English man who's probably been to Oxford or Cambridge is going to believe that the story is worth telling and it has to be to a certain extent palatable. So I think Lisa had to work very hard to establish a narrative that worked to get her first sitcom, or you know, her first sitcom, not sitcom, but her first comedy series commissioned, which was London Irish, and then had to do another job to get like you know Catholic schoolgirls on the TV screen and to make sure that that you know that's a story that was acceptable. I personally think that if it had been commissioned, well, not that RT really commissions very much, but if if it had been commissioned by an Irish broadcaster, I think you may have found a different story simply because you might have been able to tell it in a slightly different way because to get anything over the line and I know that because I'm adapting my books um, at the minute for TV and you really have to figure out just how far you can go before somebody just like it, it only takes one person in that very long chain of approval and finance yeah. mm -hmm. and yeses yeah. and creativity it takes one person to go you frightened me mm. with truth mm. Ooh, you, you frightened <laughs> me with what you're saying yeah. mm -hmm. and I think she did an incredible very dogged job for a very mm. long time mm. to figure out just what can we get on the TV mm. screens which I feel opened up the path for books mm. like mine to get published because I spent 12 years trying to get my first book published because it was unpalatable Gosh. in the sense yeah. that no, we don't publish stories about women and we don't publish stories about the women's experience of the North. Like it's not that it was unheard of, but definitely once Milkman and Dairy Girls mm. were out there, mm. you were giving mm. these people more confidence that they could take your story and somebody might be interested in it. Mm. So. <laughs> Anybody else? There was a lady in the second row. Um, Martina's Edith, um, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, and especially the dialogue. And I wondered about when you're writing it, do you write the, the chapter and then write the dialogue? I just wondered about those things. And also you use the phonetic spelling, which I think is brilliant because it brings you right into that. You know, some things like, um, are you still eating? You know, those things, it brings you immediately, that's in another, it's in the short stories, I think. But um, I just wondered if you talk a little bit about that. Because usually at workshops, you're, at, you're, you're advised not to use phonetic spelling for an accent. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wouldn't all be phonetic spelling. You know, I, I might just do a wee bit. In fact, what I do is I write it all phonetically and then I put some of it back in because uh, it looks a bit like paddy whackery almost, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> but. But that's what you have to guard against. You know, the truth can sometimes be too truthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, to a present day audience, it can seem hokey. In the same way, like, so my mother's from a wee village in County Limerick, and when we go there every couple of times a year, like, she'd go in into the kitchen and say, God bless all here. And we'd all fall about the place thinking, that's like something out of the TV. It didn't, and my grandfather, I remember him saying, Bigora, you know, he, he really did. Um, uh, and even then, when I was a kid, it seemed ancient and somehow odd to us. It just didn't, it, you know. So, so what I'm saying is, even if you're writing accurately, you have to be really careful uh, mm -hmm. that it doesn't sound too hokey to the present day. So my workaround was just to put a bit in, but not too much. Yeah. I mean, she look at how Lady Gregory was always being laughed at for her kiltart knees, as they called it, where, you know, when she was writing her material from that area of Galway. I mean, I, I think, she, you know, clearly when you see it written down, it's translated directly from the Irish, and it probably is how people spoke, and probably is what she heard. But even then, when people were reading it, they, started, they just started laughing and calling it Kiltardanese. So, so, yeah, that's what I did. I put a bit in, and I took it out, and it's, it's, um, it's just listening very hard to how people speak, and... Then I would see some of the words as well in the letters and the diaries, and um, but it wouldn't just be for this kind of dialect. Like I wrote a, a novel set in 
County Antrim in 1711 about a witchcraft trial, the house where it happened, and that has a lot of Ulster Scots in it. Mm. And um, I, I was on stronger ground there because I'd heard it all around me growing up. But you know what I discovered? That what people think is Ulster Scots is sometimes straight from the Irish. Mm. Uh, and one of the words that I was always told you're an awful through other child. I bet you were a through other child, were you? I was not. I was a gift. I was a gift. <laughs> well, so, so I'd say there's a lot of through other people here. But anyway, so through other, you know, uh, yeah. people think this is Ulster Scots. It's Trey Kayla, It's straight from the Irish. And I find that so interesting because that told me that then, at that time, there was more interaction. There was less of this silo community. Um, um, situation which grew up if people were, were, were learning, uh, w w if language was bleeding into, um, words were, were you know, being shared. And, yeah. but, but some of it is from the Scots Gaelic too, right? Because mm -hmm. Scots Gaelic mm -hmm. and Ulster Irish actually had a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of kind of cross stuff there. Yeah. So there were yeah. some Ulster Scots people who were speaking Scots Gaelic and mm -hmm. were still speaking Irish, and then we had that lovely bit in the middle. Um, but it Ulster Scots can be quite, it's been appropriated, hasn't it? It's got a certain mm. kind of connotation of mm. this is our very separatist identity and nobody in Donegal will speak Ulster Scots. And I was like, Donegal's full of Ulster Scots. <laughs> Cavan and Monaghan still have it, you know? Mm. And that's, mm. it's interesting how the identity of Ulster Scots became something... Politicised, oh, weaponised. Yeah, weaponised. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sad to make you feel like that that... You know, uh, I use loads of Ulster Scots and I love it, but... Yeah, I like it, yeah. yeah. My favourite phrase that I came across, I didn't know it, but I, uh, I rummaged around and found it, not in the internet, not on the internet, was skitter jabs, which is freckles. Mm. Oh. But, um, jabs, but yeah. phrases <laughs> from Edith, when you, when you mentioned that uh, West Cork dialect, there was a... There was, um, Edith put it in a letter and I, I did ram it into the novel by hook or by crook. I loved it so much. She was... Um, she went everywhere with her wee dogs. That group, that cast, obviously all, all, all as Irish as anyone in this room, but you know, but also very proud of a, a separate identity, another a hybrid identity as well. And they went everywhere with their dogs. They loved their wee dogs and um, would smuggle them onto ships and things to go to France and so forth. So, you know, smuggled them up their big leg of mutton sleeves and. Um, Sometimes they had to put them into the cargo section of a train, though, and she was forced to, to, to do that with, the, with one of her wee dogs. And she said to the guard, now, will you look after her? Will you look after her? And he said, ma'am, she'll be as safe as if she was in God's own pocket. <laughs> and that was just... And Edith loved this. Mm. Other writers have loved it. It's the very colourful idiom. Mm. And it's a gift. But I mean, I think the, the ability to use the local idiom and the idiom of that time mm -hmm. and put it into your book cleverly is very hard, isn't it? Because as you say, sometimes it can look, sound very hokey. You, you have know. to do it selectively. Yeah, yes, so, yeah very know, selectively. Put in yeah. lots and then take yeah. lots out yeah. is the yeah. key. And then your American editor will say, you've got 296 instances of the word we, Michelle, and nobody speaks <laughs> like that. And go, yeah. oh, the the I, already, I already <laughs> have the number of times I said we. And she's like, take it under 100. I want it under 100. And you're like, you're killing me. Oh like, my God. <laughs> we say we all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 That's it. Drink yeah. the eye. Well remembered. You drink the eye out of a cat. Yeah. I say that now. I liked it so much, but it's one of Edith's sayings. Um, she had other brilliant phrases and. Um, I came across in the letters. Trinity has um, the letters between Somerville and Ross and their London agent, Mr. James Brand Pinker. And I became very fond of Mr. Pinker. He was one of the first literary agents and he had a who's who, his stable. He had, um, he had well, he had James mm -hmm. Joyce. I don't know that he would have made too much money out of him, but, you know, because it was a long time before Joyce made money, but he had... Um, uh, uh, oh, just everybody who was writing. Arnold Bennett would have been a very lucrative client for him, and um, uh, Henry James. 
And uh, so anyway, Summer Vaughan Ross were always writing letters to Mr. Pinker and they called them their stand and deliver letters to each other because it was saying, you know, we're due royalties. Mm. And they were very charming. It was, dear Mr. Pinker, how is Mrs. Pinker? I do hope you're well. Are you getting any hunting in? And then they'd say, we have, come, we have worked out that we're due X amount of money in royalties. And then they'd say, prompt payment would be gratefully received by two hard up writers. So, you know, it was, it was good fun. <laughs> But they had these phrases, and there was the stand and deliver letter, and the other one was when they had to write an apology, they'd call it a grovel. Ought we to write a grovel, they'd say. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they just, and they, they did, uh, where words are pushed together, what do you call those, portmanteau oh, words, mm -hmm. or, yeah, portmanteau words. They were doing it long mm -hmm. before it became a thing, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. K-mid and that. Mm -hmm. They were pushing words together to make up other words. So they obviously had great fun with language. And then they had lots of brothers. Uh, Edith had five who were in the um, army and the navy, and she picked up a lot of kind of boys' slang, I think, mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. So she'd call money shekels and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're due some shekels. Mm -hmm. Well, as you can see, Martina really, really researched her, her character and before she wrote the book. I, the books are available in the bookshop um, next door. Uh, um, I've read them both. I highly recommend them. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Carveri. You did your homework. Yeah, so, yeah.